We realized we didn't practice our story. We need to get mm. our story straight. <laughs> well, that's that's the good thing. I can put you guys on the spot. I'll let you take away. I'll just add things in. Like I'll repeat what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even we didn't even expect it. <laughs> Get ready for that. Mm, um, nice. <laughs> all right. Three, two, one. Let's kick it. Hey, internet. Welcome to Next Level Nerds Movie Podcast, where we share our love of movies with you. Most of the time, we discuss, defend, and promote movies we enjoy that weren't considered critically or commercially successful, but sometimes we just ramble about stuff we like. Listeners can also join us at facebook.com slash nextlevelnerd for a smorgasbord of curated nerd news, memes, and other fun content. Now let's jump in and nerd out. I'm Justin. They're the Rubies. Kelly Hello. and Ashton. What's up? <laughs> you guys answered for each other. <laughs> Kelly was the female voice, Ashton the male. Hello. This week we're celebrating the 30 year anniversary of When Harry Met Sally. Oh, mm. Best movie in the world. Two days ago. As so, of this good. Recording. so good. Yeah. So three days ago, if you're listening to this on the day the episode drops, I can do math Four days too. Of the day. Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, Kelly, ladies first. We'll uh, we'll ask the typical question. Give me the rundown of your history with this movie. Ooh. I don't know if I know this actually. Oh yeah, uh, I guess I think my sister introduced it to me. That's my guess. Honestly, I, I can't remember the first time I watched it. It's just so intertwined with like thinking of me and my sister watching it, mm. um, and it got to the point like we would quote it. You know, mm-hmm. and, and and inter interact with the parts, um, and what's the I, time frame like college or high school? Yeah, no, it was definitely more like high school college because I got all the jokes. Okay, like, I, I was old enough to get all the jokes, and we lived together when I was in in my senior year of college. So that's probably around the time when it was. Now that I think about it, right? Um, and then I introduce it to ashton oh maybe i shouldn't steal your story oh, okay. but now it turned into <laughs> kind of a little more of our movie than even me and devin's movie i would say oh you no. might be sad to hear that <laughs> don't listen to this episode devin it's fine <laughs> this is oh. podcast. <laughs> you too yeah that was probably well definitely the first time i've seen the whole thing start to finish was after we started dating probably before we got married at one point, and I think it's still going on, it became like a Valentine's Day tradition. Because I think I bought it for you. Our first Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah. because maybe Devin had a copy or something. <gasps> <laughs> the first Sorry, I love the, the soundboard. <laughs> I the first of many. The DVD version and the Blu-ray version. Nice. I think we didn't have a Blu-ray player at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but high def, we would eventually. Yeah. High def Harry meets high def Sally. Yeah, it was it's actually one of the few Blu-rays that, that I own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I watched it, and yeah, pretty much immediately fell in love with it. I know, and you were honestly it. not an easy sell for this movie. Like I had to, I had to a little bit convince him to watch it because. I mean, he heard of it and stuff, but he was kind of like, eh, okay, chick flick, I guess I'll watch it with you. <laughs> like, was not into it. And then he laughed hysterically throughout all of it. It's Billy and he Crystal. he just kept saying, like, the writing is so good. And at that point, I was it's, like, yeah, it's... sure. I acted like I knew what he was talking about. But <laughs> It um, kind of surprises me, Ashton, that you hadn't, you hadn't seen this movie in that long, just... You know, I know you grew up in a in a household that celebrated the works of Rob Reiner, and <laughs> one, yeah, and this this one was kind of off your radar. Yeah, it was probably we were not sheltered, but you know, not a movie that our parents yeah, it is it is R rated. So. Yeah, and then just never, yeah, wasn't anywhere on my radar by the time I was late high school, mm-hmm. college, right. using my own entertainment selections or whatever (laughs) but yeah the first time was probably 2012 13 something like that yeah yeah so watch it at least eight once a year since then probably more than that so yeah you know it's one of those ones i try to watch more than once a year too oh yeah yeah it's um it came out um july 21st of 1989 
And I remember seeing this movie before going to kindergarten. So I must have seen it like <laughs> around the time it released. I remember it was like one of those movies that I was like, oh, this is, you know, like walked in the living room. My parents were watching it on HBO or something like being aware of it. And like my mom and my sister, who was 11 years, my senior kind of joking about it, having seen the movie together and stuff. Anyways, this movie is just, uh, you know, it's been around as long as I can remember watching movies and having, you know, videotapes piled up in the corner of my living room when I was a kid. You know, this was in the pile there and was always good for a laugh, whether you got the jokes or not, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's definitely stuff in there that kids will get, but there's, you know, obviously a lot of stuff that's inappropriate for kids. Um, yeah, just the kind of humor they don't appreciate. Just yeah. kind of the subtle things, the sarcastic things, the timing jokes. Uh, you know, nothing I would have appreciated or appreciated as much as I do now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember... Um, just this past time watching it, I was like, this is rated R. I don't remember this being that bad. You know, like it's one of those movies that I watch frequently, but I don't think about it a whole lot. Mm. It's just like, it's just so good. You know, it's not, I never think of this movie as being anything less than a masterpiece. And so like, I was kind of watching it a little more critically this time. I was like, what is this rated R for? And well, almost then 1989, do you think it'd be rated R now? Uh, like there's a couple f bombs. There's a couple of f bombs. The orgasm stuff. Yeah, but a lot even of sex that, talk. even but that, I think could slide yeah. by PG thirteen nowadays. So, yeah. I mean, I probably wouldn't show it to my thirteen year old kid, but I don't know. That's to mm. each his own. Mm. Um, I mean, I saw it much younger than that, and I turned out wrong. I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> So, um, yeah, the movie kind of uses this framing device of interviews with uh, couples telling their story of how they met and stuff. And uh, these segments were were something that uh, director Rob Reiner collected for the movie and used actors to deliver. And, you know, there's such delightful ways to show that everyone's story is unique and special and how amazing it is when love brings two people together. So before we get any further into the weeds... I obviously wanted to hear from you two on your story and how you two lovely people met. Well, it was the summer of love. 2012, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, summer of love. Yeah. <laughs> I was single, ready to mingle, I suppose. <laughs> as well as you can mingle, you know, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and not, you know be murdered or at least very disappointed yeah. <laughs> so anyway i signed up for okay cupid and it was the second time around i'd been on it uh, i probably got on like a date a year or two before yeah and was like yeah that's enough of this <laughs> me too it was my second time yeah on okay cupid yeah and yeah it there's not that much to say uh i did have a friend it was like the day after kelly and i had our first date he was very curious about like what were the parameters you searched on <laughs> that's kind of what it is it's like googling for a date you know yeah <laughs> uh and i was like i can't remember to be honest i was like my zip code <laughs> yeah high standards yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which actually she lived in she, this zip code. <laughs> I lied and I lied about my zip code. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. <laughs> oh she my lived gosh. in Erie at the time, but put Pittsburgh. Yeah. Can't uh, trust anything you read on the yeah. internet. Seriously. Well, speaking of which <laughs> 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 we tell the story of her profile picture, she had gotten a guitar for her birthday or something the year before or something like that, and she's just <laughs> like on the guitar, you know. <laughs> And I was like, oh, this girl must be musically inclined and creative and all that stuff. Turns out it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up that guitar about maybe five times total yeah. since then. <laughs> yeah. I did uh, just so get it. No, I had just gotten it, though. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was a very good picture. Right. And that was that took about 20 tries. <laughs> <laughs> no. The first message you sent her was how much for the fender? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I probably mentioned it. I was like, oh, I like your picture. Because, you know, it's kind of like if you read the, like, tips or whatever the website gets you on how to get a response. It's like, mention something specific in the picture that you like or whatever. You would read the FAQs. On I the was going to say, I did not read the tips. 
on a dating website. <laughs> Clearly, she had like super nerd in her parameters. Yeah, but I think I messaged you first. If I'm correct. You definitely did. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's and awesome. Then she wrote back about six paragraphs. <laughs> Which is kind of and a... you guys have been married now for how long? Five years. Yeah. Uh... It'll be... Six in November, right? Mm-hmm. Five years, two kids, and by golly, I have rarely met two people I know that are make a better match for each other. Oh, I mean, I always thought, bored with the... oh, I always thought it was going to be Evan and Ashton till death do they part. But it is a little still, but <laughs> I'm in there too now. So it is. Yeah, <laughs> Ashton, you make good couples. <laughs> Whether it be Evan or that's right, I'm the common denominator. <laughs> <laughs> well, Is there I didn't want... I left out, or I mean, we you know messaged for a little bit. It wasn't long before we met, and then it's pretty quick turnaround. Uh, well, I think the key factor and... it was Prime Day. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the key thing was we both had very low expectations of dating on the internet. Lowered expectations. <laughs> and then we were like, ooh, you're like a normal person. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know, how many people I know that have met online. Like, my brother and his wife, uh, they met online. Same kind of situation, you know. Single fella looking to settle down, meet the right girl, you know. He uh, came across this girl that uh, they were just telling their story this weekend, and I thought it was kind of cute, but... Uh, she never thought she was going to get a second date. Like, <laughs> and we always joke, like, you, you know, like, Brandon hit the lottery. Why would you think you weren't going to get a second date? Like, <laughs> so, uh, anyways. <laughs> the second day was, like, the next day, pretty much. Pretty we much. got lunch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you just said breakfast, hey yeah. um, <laughs> uh, That's kind of a story, too. Like, I waited really what? long for the first kiss. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What are we talking about here? <laughs> 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 already movie, already podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like we said, our rating on this one, runtime of an hour and 35, which is right around that happy area. Castle Rock Entertainment, Nelson Entertainment are the two production companies that bring this one to us. And the Rotten Tomatoes score on this one, very high. 90% on the tomato meter, 89 on the audience score. Uh, Metacritic, not as not as uh, pleased with this one at 76 out of 100. And the cinema score was an A+. Here's the thing that kills me about this movie. The financials. The budget was $16 million and the box office was $92.8 million. Like, holy crap, what an investment. (laughs) I'll make that one all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, It actually was... I thought uh, it was 16 million, though. I mean, that seems high. 16 million, yeah. I mean, I guess you're probably paying for the star power, I would say. Billy Crystal was, like, on fire in the late 80s, early 90s. Like, he put asses in seats. And Meg Ryan was, like, the rom-com... Sweetheart of the late eighties. Yeah, this is kind of one of her first. Ones. Yeah, this was early on for her, but she is totes adorbs so. though. Mm. <laughs> it's one of her best movies for sure. Absolutely, she gets old. You know, not old like age, but like, eh. like she's kind of the same character in most movies. I feel like, but but she's just so uh, endearing. I could see that. I could see that. Um, this one was actually nominated for best original screenplay. On at the uh, Academy Awards and nominated for Best Film and won Best Original Screenplay at the BAFTAs. Um, and it was nominated for five go- Golden Globes. Golden Globes. Golden Globes. Um, best Motion Picture, Comedy, or Musical, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Actor, Best Actress. And, you know, there's, there's a case to be made that uh, it probably deserved... Uh, to win some of those um and yeah i just i've been wanting to do a rom-com for a while now um kelly and i had talked about this uh a while back um you know and i said hey that movie's turning 30 this year we should definitely celebrate it um but this genre has always seemed a little formulaic you know there are a few rom-coms that i like um so there's you know i have a few 
a few that I like, but this is just the best of all time. But one of the greatest films of all time, I think. Um, I guess it is. You know, they are formulaic, but this is one of the original. I mean, it was. It was so. This is the story that's been repeated over and over. And maybe right. this is a repeat, and I'm just not aware. But to me, this is the the original one. Well, it definitely started doing things that weren't common in movies and television. Like, um, we are kind of nerds and super fans of the movie. Like, we've watched the behind the scenes and the <laughs> right. making of that are on the Blu-ray, and they talk about that. Like, um, Rob Reiner and Nora Ephron talking about the script and how they the movie has these conversations that like people kind of have or men have mm-hmm. and women have, but they don't really have together. And they certainly don't have a movie about it. Right. And that's, that's why it resonated really well was it was so like, it's Relatable. funny because it's true and that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. But it was kind of, I don't, I don't know if it's bold is the right word, but <laughs> it wasn't like everybody's doing it that. It wasn't so, common. Yeah. It was yeah, unusual. It was, to be and kind of so open and honest and, you know, talk about the women you're sleeping with another woman or whatever, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Scandalous. <laughs> I think it was the cusp well, of that becoming super common in the 90s and entertainment. Yeah, and the taglines were a little, um, you know, risque for the time, too. Uh, there was only two of them. And I feel like this these two taglines oversimplify the film. Um, but it's can two friends sleep together and still love each other in the morning? And <laughs> mm. can Spoilers. men and can men and women be friends or does sex always get in the way? I like that one better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which I like it pains my feminist heart to say, but like <laughs> also, is that kind of still true? Like, what? is it can Men, well, I mean, it's we're friends. We can't just say men and women. I guess. I mean, it's just an interesting question. You know, it is an is interesting question. Sexual attraction more... involved. You know, of course, it's not just like men and women. That's so heteronormative. But like, it's it's kind of there's truth to it, and I kind of hate saying that. Mm. Like, yeah, like does that kind of attraction, physical, even emotional attraction, does get in the way of just being friends with somebody? Yeah, like, uh, people are sexual beings. I guess that's yeah. what this movie feels like. It was the fir- <laughs> one of the first ones to, to really say. Tell us more, Dr. Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> who, in- who invited the doctor to psychoanalyze the movie? We're talking See? about wow. when Harry met Sally, not analyze this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think, it, you know, it is. there's some interesting philosophy in here, and I think that's the... that's. You know, the taglines do make some interesting points, but, uh, or, you know, pose some interesting questions. And I think the movie kind of doesn't really, it doesn't really answer that question to a point. You know, it doesn't say, oh, well, this is yes, this is no. You know, it's more like, well, they're really good friends, but they also really love each other and they fall in love and they're still really good friends. You know, like, I don't think it puts too fine a point on an answer to it. Sure. If well, it answers I mean, it at all. If you're looking for the answers to those kind of questions. <laughs> yeah. A movie from 1989. <laughs> that's, a, that's a comedy and an hour and a half long. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Look elsewhere, my friend. Life's a little more complicated than that. Yeah. But that wouldn't be funny. So they don't make a movie about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this one was written by Nora Ephron and directed by Rob Reiner, uh, as we said, kind of director of some of the best comedies and movies of our generation. And he's a pretty fine actor in his own right, too. He was pretty funny in uh, Wolf of Wall Street, um, playing Jordan Belfort's dad. Um, <laughs> but he's also, he also did uh, This is Spinal Tap. Um, Stand By Me, The Princess Bride, another Stephen King property, Misery. Um, and if you look close, at one point, Harry's actually reading that book, uh, Stephen King's Misery. And, uh, and Reading the last page of it. Yeah. Just and, finishing a book. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the next movie that Rob Reiner would go on to make. Um, and then, of course, A Few Good Men, The American President, Ghosts of Mississippi, and the bucket list, which reviewing when Harry met Sally was on my bucket list. There you go. So uh, the music in this one, there's lots of jazz and swing and classical standards. 
Um, there's some performances by Harry Connick Jr., Louis Armstrong, and Ella Fitzgerald, George and Ira Gershwin, Ray Charles, Benny Goodman, Mozart, Bing Crosby, Sinatra. It's a really good soundtrack, actually. Um, yeah, it's kind of um, I, I, the soundtrack comes to mind a little bit, especially the jazzy Harry Connick Jr. stuff, because um, it's a little like uh, uh, what's anachronist anachronistic was the word like that music's a little earlier than the movie actually takes place oh right you know what i mean but it kind of i don't know pays homage to kind of these old it's non movies. Yes. Mm-hmm. it feels romantic though, yeah yeah right. style of music right. right yeah it fits really well mm-hmm. i mean it's like you're saying the movie's just well done all around and that's another yeah it fits good the part tone of, of like <laughs> you know it it the way the movie frames itself with having these older couples tell their story and stuff. And then at the very end, you know, spoiler alert, um, you know, showing Harry and Sally telling their story and stuff. You get the feeling that these are two people that grow old together. And so Mm -hmm. it kind of gives you like that nostalgia for your grandparents and their story of how they fell in love and that kind of thing. Um, that's you know, what I was going to say. I think the, the soundtrack contributes to the nostalgia, which gives it staying power. Like, if it was just an 80s movie that was kind of, you know, old-fashioned in its time, yeah. in its views, and it had 80s music, I'd be kind of like, eh, well, that was good in the 80s, but it's not great now. But the offsetting the music and the soundtrack to, you know, kind of even older, and then it being, you know, a little old-fashioned feels okay, because it makes it more, like, vintage and nostalgic. Right, and I think that's that's something that um, you know the movie does a good job of, even you know referencing like Casablanca and stuff as much as it does, and that kind of thing. It really kind of c- cements itself as a classic film in my mind, as opposed to like a dated film, like you're saying. Yes. Um, you know, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty timeless. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the cast, we pretty much have four main characters that we focus on, which is Billy Crystal as Harry, Meg Ryan as Sally, Carrie Fisher, thank you, as Marie. I haven't seen old Carrie around the uh, Next Level Nerd movie podcast in a while. Uh, Bruno Kirby as Jess. And Bruno Kirby, I freaking love this dude. He was not <laughs> in enough movies before he passed away. Um, he was in The Godfather uh, 2. I don't think he was in the first one because I think he was... Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's only in the second one. Um, and he was in City Slickers, um, right. another movie with Billy that. Crystal that is excellent um, and plays basically the same character there, but... Uh, you know, he's Billy Billy Crystal's straight man. Um, but uh, he's he's excellent in that movie as well. Um, yeah, comment, I think, that was one of my first comments about this movie, was these two supporting actors were great choices. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not, not exactly scene stealers, but they help the scene so much. And they mm-hmm. play these parts, like, super well of, like, the best friends. Um and it's just again, that's like things that make um you know elevate a movie from good to great are really yeah, good supporting actors. Just who, who the take a little role things. And fit it real well, you know. Just the little things like Carrie Fisher's character being in love <laughs> with a married man. Like <laughs> th- I don't know where that came from. I don't know who came up with it. But the whole thing of everyone telling her, you know, he's not going to leave his wife. He's never going to leave his wife. And then she gets to the point where she's like, I have the feeling he's never going to leave his wife. And (laughs) Sally's like, that's because he's not. (laughs) No one thinks that. (laughs) No one thinks that. uh, I know you're right. right. I know you're right. This movie, uh, unfortunately, does have its share of dissenters who wrongly think it's not good. Um, Most of these... uh, uh, critiques are a little unfounded and unfair in my opinion. Um, but we'll jump into those in the critical corner here. Jay Boyer of the Orlando Sentinel said, During the slow passages, I wondered to what extent the film's creators were aware of its Woody-isms, I guess alluding to uh, Woody Allen, and to what degree they feel guilty about ripping Allen off. It's like... It's an eroticism, I guess, but... Nothing yeah. else, really. I, I mean, mean this movie in New York, like okay. Yeah, neurotic. <laughs> now that I say it, you know, maybe it's worse than I thought. Ne- <laughs> the 
the Woody Allen, like, uh, neurotic uh, Jewish man in New York trying to figure out relationships. And, you know, that was, it's very much, in my opinion, um, like a Woody Allen film, but better. Cause I, I was just going to say that, too. I can't stand Woody Allen. <laughs> It's in, it's more endearing than a lot of the Woody Allen characters. Right, like right. he's not trying to make them endearing; he just wants them to be neurotic. But they get the but, balance of neurotic and endearing pretty well of, in this movie. Out of kind of Woody Allen, we get we get directors like Rob Reiner and kind of these people that are examining the. Um, you know, we get Jerry Seinfeld, we get we get Larry David that are more interested in like observation comedy about society and, you know, relationships and, you know, sociology and those kind of things. And it's just, you know, OK, if they're doing it, it's still funny. You know, it's still good. It's still done really well. Like nobody's steal. like there's there's so much improv in this movie. How can you say you're ripping off Woody Allen, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And I mean, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a thing when there's sort of similarities or paying homage or inspired by, it's very easy if you want to be critical to say, oh, they just ripped it off. Yeah. It's like, well, no, I mean, they created their own original (laughs) screenplay movie. Like, yeah. Unless, you know, it's like an obvious, like synonyms for the titles. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You change like John to, Bond or something. I don't know. <laughs> Not a real name, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> the speaking of Johns, Jonathan Rosenbaum from uh, uh, the ah. Chicago Reader <laughs> said that uh, fans of Billy Crystal's amphibian qualities may be amused, but the rest of us have to contend with a slavish Woody Allen imitation. Amphibian? <laughs> what does that even mean? Writers. Like his, his, yeah, he wanted to gain bonus points. Um, but. <laughs> You know, base- can you use amphibious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the only way I can see that happening. <laughs> this one, this one, I took particular issue with, um, and I, I don't really know this publication, but uh, David Starrett from the Christian Science Monitor, Reiner and his stars Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan are better at displaying the foibles of human natures than exploring them. It's a fucking comedy. <laughs> Like, did he not know going in? <laughs> like, yes. well, they never is. solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ralph Novak from People Magazine. By the end, when everyone should be rooting for Crystal and Ryan to get together, the whole enterprise has long since soured. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, no, he's running through New York. You're not oh, cheering for him. Gosh. You have no heart, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Run, Billy Crystal, run! I'm going to have to look it up, but uh, this movie, I mean, we'll kind of get to how, you know, of a pop culture thing it is kind of too, probably. But uh, it's it's played in the first episode of uh, The Mindy Project, which the first season of that is hilarious. Uh, and that's kind of her background is she's this hopeless romantic because she grew up watching these movies, like when Harry mm-hmm. Met Sally and... <laughs> Go ahead. But, I'll tell my story after. Anyway, her, the doctor that she's kind of like, she ultimately starts dating, but is kind of like a friend of me or whatever at the beginning. He's like tearing it down. He's like, this movie's so stupid. <laughs> she's like, she doesn't want to talk to him. But she just wants to have a good time on New Year's Eve. <laughs> That's what it kind of feels like. It's like, if you want to be real cynical, realist about it, like, yeah. whatever. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that's why Devin and I watched this movie. It was like in some other romantic comedy that we were watching. And we were like, we've never seen that movie. Hmm, let's mm. watch it. Yeah. Variety said uh, Rob Reiner directs with deafness and sincerity, making the material seem more engaging than it is, at least until the plot mechanics begin to unwind and the film seems shapeless. Ay, ay, ay. Like, has he got somewhere to be? Like, yeah, are you it's, done? You got to set a movie up. You know? Wrap it up. Can't just like hit the ground running. Yeah, whatever. Well, I already saw Harry meeting Sally in the first five seconds. After that, it was all this love story. <laughs> I always thought that'd be a funny like YouTube clip or whatever. It's like when Harry met Sally, and they're like, "Hi, <laughs> she Sally, all up. right." It's like the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one's free, folks. Ashton's full of good ideas. 
Anything else you guys want to say about the movie before we jump into the breakdown and talking points? Just that my um, whole story about my intro to it was apparently false because I texted my sister. Oh, my and God. And she said, you showed me. And that's all I know. I can't remember at all. Wow. Could have been that. <laughs> Ashton, <laughs> cut all that. <laughs> Ashton! Start over. Hey, Internet. <laughs> hey, Internet. Welcome to Next Level Nerd. <laughs> In 1977... Two University of Chicago graduates, Harry Burns and Sally Albright, are sharing a drive to New York City, and Sally happens to be friends with Harry's girlfriend, Amanda. And Sally's... Amanda Rice. Reese. That's what I meant. Yeah. I do use that joke all the time. (laughs) Sorry, skipping ahead. So uh, Sally is uh, on her way to journalism school, um, and... During the trip, just immediately finds Harry to be obnoxious because he's like this really unhappy, negative person. Because he is obnoxious? Yeah. Oh, he's absolutely obnoxious. He spits (laughs) cherry pits at a closed window. (laughs) (laughs) He is obnoxious. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to roll the window down now. (laughs) And uh, she's like this very practical, opinionated person who can be a little snobbish from time to time. But, you know, he's kind of blunt and ill-mannered and talks about personal matters like her sex life and stuff like that. And they're just oil and water. Like, both of these people are completely unlikable for two different reasons. (laughs) She's wound too tight. He's a little too loose. (laughs) And uh, Harry eventually tells her that uh, he thinks she's attractive. And uh, he starts to backpedal a little bit when she comes off as being a little offended and he says that she's just objectively attractive and uh you know she's like you know you're dating my friend and stuff and he's you know just continues to grate on her nerves and she suggests that they should just be friends but uh during the ride you know they kind of discuss their differing ideas about relationships and stuff and sally disagrees with with Harry that uh, men and women cannot be friends because as he says, the sex part always gets in the way and they make it to New York and part ways with a handshake. And what is the name of that structure that they're standing under? Oh, it's like, it's, NYU, it's the arch. Right? No, uh, I can't remember, but it's the arch of something or yeah. other. But anyways, uh, five <laughs> years. Are fast enough to Google. Sorry. Yeah, mm, it's all right. <laughs> Ashton. So five it. years later, uh, they run into each other at an airport, and she's like making out with this guy, and she's dating this dude that uh, Harry recognizes as somebody that used to live in the same building as him, and she's kind of relieved when she can't when. Um, Harry can't really place her face or doesn't know who she is, but she remembers his philosophy on men and women being friends and um, talks to her boyfriend about it and stuff. And her and her boyfriend share their first I love you's before she boards a plane. And uh, Harry ends up sitting behind her, remembers who she is. And the guy sitting next to her gives up his seat. Uh, after she, you know, does her kind of running gag of like, Ordering something but needing it very particular and Wait. the way she wants it. Here's how I want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the and side. That's, that's what clicks with me because that's what happened at the restaurant in a few yeah. scenes previous where she <laughs> hilariously orders. I don't even remember what it was. Oh, man. The, I used uh, to be able to say the whole thing. The ice cream owl mode. It's uh-huh. the only part the I The pie. Remember. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I'll have the <laughs> pie. Only if you have heated. it heated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then nothing. Not even the pie. No, but no. just the pie. But not eat it. So once again, he kind of gets on her nerves and stuff, and they start to catch up on old times. And Harry starts waxing philosophical again about relationships, and he says he's getting married to a lawyer, and explains to her Helen Helenson or something. <laughs> She's yes. her name. Sorry, I can't stop quoting it when you're talking. I'm just gonna just gonna back up. I mean, yeah, that's one of the great things about the movie. It's, <laughs> it's so quotable. insanely quotable. Yeah. It really is. Um, but uh, he, you know, he says he's marrying this lawyer named Helen, and starts to uh, kind of get more into the philosophy and telling her why her idiosyncrasies and nuances of male and female relationships are a pain in the ass, and she kind of dismisses them once they reach their destination. She's just like, okay. That's enough of you. Goodbye. 
Yeah, and you can see as the movie kind of uh, goes from like year to year to year until it finally like slows down and goes real time. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of their different maturities and views on things. Like they've all both had experiences and right. a little bit or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's kind of you know set in his ways and has learned a particular lifestyle. She's gone a different path or whatever. Yeah, and she she gets more like. She's just like doesn't put up with it quicker and quicker. You know, it's like you look like a normal person, but you're actually the devil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another five years later, Sally's having lunch with her friends and kind of they're sharing in their relationship woes. And this is where we get to meet Marie, who's probably my favorite character in the movie because she's got like a Rolodex. Rolodex, yes. <laughs> Of like dudes' phone numbers and like she's yeah. trying to set people up on dates and she's like so obsessed with like finding the right man and she's talking about her uh, the guy she's currently with who is married and you know they go into that whole bit um, and she announces Sally announces that her and her boyfriend Joe have broken up um, and her friend Marie tries to set her up on a blind date. Well, at a Giants game, uh, we jump over there, and Harry and his buddy Jess are talking about how he's getting a divorce on his birthday. <laughs> and <laughs> as you're as you're gesturing, they have to do the wave every time the wave comes around, and it's, it's like probably my best. Like, it's such best a good scene. In any, <laughs> Mr. Zero <laughs> knew before you. Mr. Zero knew. Zero. <laughs> I think this is definitely the moment when I was like, "Wow, this movie is like something different." Like, yeah. but he does that. Oh, that's rough. But they're doing the movie. Yeah, <laughs> just carrying on this like really serious During conversation a in the middle of the game, but they're still like. <laughs> and he's all like disheveled looking, and is like grown like a, a depression beard and stuff. Uh, you know, it's good when you're laughing like just as hard at remembering it as you are when you're actually watching. <laughs> So uh, Sally and Marie are in this bookstore when Harry bumps into him, and he's kind of like creeping. Like when they show him, he's like standing in the aisle, like looking over a book. Personal growth. <laughs> personal growth. Personal growth. Yeah, <laughs> somebody's staring at you from personal growth. Um, and the, he bumps into her and says hi, and they they start to talk about their relationship issues and um, share a cup of coffee together. And Sally tells him that uh, she and Joe broke up because she wanted a family and he didn't want to marry and Harry's wife left him for another man. So they kind of grieve together, take a walk and start to become friends. And, you know, Harry apologizes for being an ass the first few times they met. And that to me right there is like, like you said, Ashton, he shows a, a degree of maturity and like personal growth that like now he's almost ready for an actual relationship. Like, you know, once he gets to this point where he goes, oh, geez, you know, maybe I'm the asshole, you know, <laughs> he kind of sure. he, he kind of that to me is the big turn in the movie for him. Um, and at that point, um, Sally asks him to dinner. And they start having lo late night phone conversations, going out to dinner together, spending time, and just discussing their love lives and wallowing in their own depression, even like watching movies together on the phone. Um, you know, and they, they start to get to know each other and talk about their lives and their dreams and their desires and stuff. And they go to a museum together, and Billy Crystal um, actually ad libbed the whole, but I would. Be proud to partake oh. of your pecan pie. <laughs> yeah. uh, he ad libs that whole scene, and if you watch it, you can see Meg Ryan. She laughs and looks to her right, like takes an extreme look to her right. And uh, Rob Reiner was there prompting her to just go with it, go with it, go with the improv. And uh, you know, it's it's one of many scenes that they improv throughout this movie, um, which Reiner was kind of known for letting his actors. Um, kind of make up their own dialogue and stuff. But um, Sally's kind of uh, a little bit offended by Harry's ability to have sex without any romantic entanglements. Like, she's not necessarily jealous, I don't think. I think she's more... I think there's a little bit of that, but I think she's more... Like, he's just such a pig. Like, he's just gonna, like, just slut around like that and, like, 
you yeah, know, it just represents like what's wrong with the male attitude in relationships, right? And cause a lot of heartache for probably a lot of friends she's had or she's had them set herself and really just kind of, you know, she says in the one scene, like just generally in the world, like you are a friend to all women and I am a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she, she like accuses him of being a pig and stuff. And so he says, uh, as long as everyone's satisfied, what's the difference? Well, she explains that most women, um, they go, they go out to lunch. The scene kind of jumps and she explains that most w- women have faked an orgasm and most men are sure no woman has faked it with them. So do the math. But Harry, like, kind of contends that he could spot a fake orgasm and Sally fakes the orgasm at the table in one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history um, plays out and is punctuated with the famous line from Rob Reiner's mother who makes a cameo by telling the waiter I'll have what she's having. And it was actually Meg Ryan's idea to fake the orgasm in a, and do it in a restaurant for this scene. And the I I'll know. have, yeah, and the I'll have what she's having line was suggested by Billy Crystal, and Rob Reiner just thought it would be funny if it was his old Jewish mother. That did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and it's so iconic and classic, and it really is. a billion times or whatever. And I believe it's Katz's Deli in New York that yeah. has yeah. that still has. They have like a sign hanging up that says something like, "I hope you decide to have what she's having" or something like that. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, just at that booth where or at the table where they sat. Um, but later that year at a, uh, at a new year's Eve party, Harry and Sally finally find themselves attracted to each other and share a quick, what did I miss something? Oh, I thought you were at the end. I was like, no, 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 no. no. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is the first years. new year's they share together where they of have course. the quick, quick peck oh, on the lips. Dance cheek to cheek. Oh, it's so platonic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they <laughs> they kind of remain friends and decide they're going to set up their best friends, Marie and Jess, um, or set each other up with their best friends, Marie and Jess. And the four go out to dinner, and instead of Jess and Marie falling in love with Sally and Harry, Jess and Marie leave the date early and catch a cab home together. Four months later, they're engaged, <laughs> and Harry and Sally are shopping for engagement presents at the Sharper Image. <laughs> yeah, or like home warming as they're moving in together or whatever yeah uh yeah and that date scene is uh one of the top scenes i think because the four of them just yeah each other they mm-hmm. work really well together the direction's just really good and it's it's so funny <laughs> just like and i think it's again we've all been there where it's like someone's like trying to make a connection and it's just totally not working like yeah. oh, you're both from new jersey what part oh yeah she she <laughs> says something about not no not like you whatever yeah, Sally says something about not liking one particular writer, and Bruno <laughs> Kirby's <laughs> as Jess is just like, oh, it's just the you know the only reason I ever became a writer. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Not it's important. A, yeah, not it's important. Fun. And it's funny because you can watch that scene multiple times and try to listen to the different conversations that are going mm-hmm. on. Because I remember I didn't quite catch that part the yeah. first few times I watched it, and then I, you know, when I caught it, I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. So they're at the uh, they're at the sharper image uh, shopping for presents and stuff, and you know they're looking at all this goofy stuff, and uh, they find this karaoke machine and sing Surrey with the fringe on top from Oklahoma, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like a particularly hilarious scene, but when he explodes later on, <laughs> singing Surrey with the fringe on top <laughs> in front of Ira. <laughs> In front of Ira, but Harry's ex-wife walks into the store when she sees them singing with her new man Ira and greets them. And <laughs> Harry is just absolutely shook. So they go to uh, Marie and Jess's apartment later, um, and Marie and Jess are arguing over the home decor, specifically the wagon wheel coffee table. <laughs> and. <laughs> Roy <laughs> Rogers <laughs> garage sale. I thought you liked it. I'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry explodes about his own failed marriage and storms out. Um, you know, uh, uh, with some of the best dialogue Billy Crystal's ever ever given when he just goes ape shit. Um, and Sally apologizes and and leaves to console him and kind of says, "Hey, you know, he ran into his ex wife today." 
And she talks to him about he how he expresses his feelings and stuff. But he's so angry, he starts criticizing her and how she deals with his with her problems and everything. And in your typical rom com, this would be the thing that divided them. But instead, Harry does the mature thing and apologizes, and they head back inside. It's like, hey, that's kind of refreshing. You know, there was no, there was no, you know, he wasn't being mean to her or anything, you know, like they just apologize and get over it like you should. Right. So, um, anyway, I think we can all attest we've been there where it's, you start having an argument and at some point you're like, I'm losing and I'm wrong. Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, you're, but you're like, oh yeah, they're making a lot of good points <laughs> yeah. and I should probably just apologize or a lot of times we, if we're arguing, We'll just like start laughing because we know like it's how so ridiculous stupid. the other one's being, and, <laughs> or yeah. how ridiculous we yeah, are. Yeah, as soon about. as like one of us can break the other, basically, you know, laughter was <laughs> uh, tends Good to diffuse it quickly, and we realize we're being stupid, or it's just the trait we have that we let get out of control. Or, you know? <laughs> so a while later, um, they're they're at Jess and Marie's place with their new dates. Um, and both of them are like kind of offhandedly criticizing their other dates. Like Harry is dating some, uh, a baker and it's Sally's like, he doesn't even like sweets. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, there's my favorite line in the, in that, uh, scene though is, um, it's a little bit dated, but when he says, I asked her where she was when Kennedy was shot and she said, Ted Kennedy was shot. <laughs> like, you know, kind of showing their age difference. Um, you know, and and that night over the phone, um, baby fish set, mouth isn't your favorite line of that scene. <laughs> <laughs> baby, baby fish, fish mouth. Oh, that's They're taking the nation fixer. by storm. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so <laughs> she can't draw. <laughs> <laughs> so that night over the phone, um, Sally calls Harry. And, you know, she tells him that her ex-boyfriend, Joe, is getting married. And she's just having a crisis about her love life. And he rushes over to her apartment to comfort her. And they end up having sex. Um, my oh favorite my line in that scene, though, and I'm going to be 40. Yes! <laughs> okay. But not for a he long time. Hears. But it's there. <laughs> <laughs> that is the line. Uh, or that scene is I think probably one of Kelly's favorite scenes. It is definitely and, uh, my favorite scene. And, and part of it is definitely because I am kind of like that when I cry. <laughs> yeah. She's a paralegal. Her name is Tiffany. <laughs> but all the time. When Devin turned 32, we said it probably like 50 times that year. <laughs> I'm going to be 40. Someday. Eight years. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> uh. So, um, yeah, he rushes to her apartment to comfort her, and they end up having sex. And Harry seems to be uh, caught off guard and having some remorse about what he's just done. But Sally seems very relieved and very much in love with him. And true to form, uh, Harry kind of leaves in distress, but makes plans to call her later that day and and go out to dinner. Um, and they both... Uh, they both call Marie and Jess, and it's great because we get this excellent phone scene with the four actors playing off of each other. And, uh, you know, they're like, is that Harry on the other line? No, that's Brian Gumbel. Uh, <laughs> Brian Gumbel on <with> TV. <laughs> yeah. And so they're just, uh, you know, playing off of each other. And Marie and Jess are kind of glad that they finally got together. Just makes sense. We've been praying for it. <laughs> and it's... a wonderfully written scene. directed and acted scene like the timing yeah uh, i mean i was glancing through th some of the trivia and it said it took them like 60 takes to nail it oh, that's what I was just saying. but it's worth the work because it's so funny and yeah it's like i don't know uh, it's just flawless yeah it is yeah, an it is absolutely awesome. excellent scene you know harry and sally both feel like what they've done is a mistake and stuff and the friendship kind of cools over the next three weeks until they're together at Jess and Marie's wedding. And they share this really like the most awkward moment you could with an ex because they're standing at the altar as best man and maid of honor, kind of looking each other in the eyes. <laughs> and like 
the uh, you know they you know kind of what they're both thinking. And Harry kind of attempts to to mend his friendship with Sally, but she's angry and feels that they can't be friends anymore. She even goes so far as to slap him in the face. And I love in the next scene when they walk out of the kitchen after he's been slapped in the face, there's still a giant red mark on his face. Like, I, I don't, I mean, maybe on the Blu-ray you saw it, Ashton, because it's high <laughs> def, but um, he definitely has a red mark on his uh, right cheek. Um, but uh, Jess gives this toast to both of them, but he's like, to Harry and Sally, who have we ever found even remotely attractive? <laughs> <laughs> we right. neither of us would be here. <laughs> it's just like salt in a wound, my man. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. So they spend the next few weeks miserable, and it's like one of the saddest freaking scenes you'll ever see when she's cutting down the or dragging the Christmas tree home by herself um, because the previous year they'd kind of done that together mm -hmm. and stuff. And that scene just always stuck with me. Um, and Harry keeps calling her and leaving her messages, trying to patch things up. And eventually she relents and answers one of his calls. Um, and he apologizes and asks her to this new year's party. And she tells him no. So he stays home eating cookies and watching Dick Clark. Um, but then he decides to go for a, a lonesome, uh, self-reflective stroll. So meanwhile, this, so this scene I never got a chance to say this. So I'm going to say it now on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I always felt it was a little different tone of a movie. Like, I don't think the rest of the movie has any inner monologue. And then all of a sudden, like, you hear what he's thinking. I mean, obviously you need to because he's alone and not talking to anybody. Right. But it, it, it just struck me every time I watch it. It's like, it just feels different. Like, most movies yeah. have an inner dialogue with one of the main characters at least the whole time. And then it's yeah. like, all of a sudden, he's, and maybe that's intentional to make you feel like, you know, yeah, they're supposed to be together, and now they're not. Um, but I don't know, it just always strikes me as kind of off. Yeah, he's sitting there eating Malamars. It's bad. And... It's, yeah. <laughs> he's like, it's yeah, a cookie I've never even heard of. What? Yeah. <laughs> the greatest cookies in the world. <laughs> My dad loves it. And he's playing with the basketball thing that he said he has to get at Sharper Image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he uh, he goes out for his little pity stroll and stuff, and Sally's out on a date with some bozo. Um, this guy's just terrible. But Harry then walks past the location where she dropped him off after their road trip together to New York from college. Washington which was Square, Arch. Washington Square. There you go. I don't have to cut that part before. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it in. So Sally is uh, having a pretty shitty time at this party and decides that she's going to leave before midnight because she doesn't want to be there and not have anyone to kiss and be depressed. So Harry realizes what he has to do and begins frantically running to the party and catches her as she's about to leave and declares his love for her. And uh, she argues that the only reason he's there is because he's lonely and it's New Year's. But he goes on and starts listing the many things he realized that he loves about her. And he tells her he loves her and he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. And the line is so freaking iconic and so perfect because he says, when you realize you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. And she says she hates him because she can't hate him. And they share this passionate kiss and marry three months later. And then the movie ends with them on the couch talking about their wedding and how they met like just, just like all the segments and stuff with the old married couples. And this scene was actually entirely improvised as well uh, by the actors. And it's, you know, it's funny cause they go off on this tangent that you could see these two people going off on about like coconut being on the side or something with the, with the, the chocolate's cake. on the side because in the coconut cake, Not everybody it can coconut. get very soggy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's yeah. very, so it's I very thought, important. That makes sense. It is improvised. I always thought Meg Ryan looks like annoyed or antsy in that scene. But they don't reason. seem affectionate or yeah. in love, really. I know. I've always kind of like been disappointed felt like by she that. Was little annoyed scene. or something. But maybe that's why. Maybe she's not as into the improv or whatever. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's just another one of my weird observations. I haven't seen this over a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ruby's and the uh, well before your rant. Sorry. <laughs> don't spoil it. Uh, but I don't think we mentioned, or maybe you did, the these uh, little couple interviews that happen throughout the movie. 
originally yeah. he wanted it to be like real live couples telling their actual story mm -hmm. but i guess he filmed it and they were terrible <laughs> <laughs> like really boring to listen to so that's why he got the actors to so do he hired actors to reenact some of the stories that he liked right uh, so they would come off on camera a lot better which i always thought was funny because when you're watching it the way they casted it and they mm -hmm. they seem real they really do yeah. I, know, I was disappointed when i heard that they weren't actually couples but they were true stories, just not yeah. the, the same people telling them. Yeah. And even those have a lot of kind of iconic lines from them. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, see the girl from across the bar or whatever. Mm. See that girl? I'm going to marry her. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because, like, whenever I see couples, they do some of the things in the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> like the, what What was her name? Roberta. What, what were we doing? Oh, Roberta, right. <laughs> yeah. Or they're, like, telling the story, like, together, like, almost over laughing at each other. Finishing <laughs> each other's. Sentences. Yeah. There it is. Sandwiches. <laughs> Sandwiches. Without further ado, it's that time. I'm going on a rant. Much of the dialogue that screenwriter Nora Ephron wrote was taken from the banter of real-life friends Rob Reiner and Billy Crystal. And that's where this movie really shines, in my opinion. The dialogue and conversations between friends... It's what made Seinfeld so special and relatable to people. The characters are just trying to not only understand the opposite sex, but also the society and the norms of the society in which they live. The film is actually based on director Rob Reiner's experiences post-divorce as a single man. And ironically, Reiner met his current wife during the making of this movie. So, like I had said before, in most romantic comedies, there's... There's some sort of threat or manufactured misunderstanding that keeps the romantic leads from falling in love. But this film never falls back on these cliched tropes. But instead, we see two people who are kept apart by their own narrow-minded views and hang-ups. And this film takes a hard look at what it, what it is that makes men and women want to be together and correctly states that friendly love should always be the basis of any romantic relationship, in my opinion. At least, that's what I've always found. So, I mean, if you want to be happy with someone, it should be because you love every little thing about them. But that's what is so great about this movie. It shows that as you grow and mature over time, if you're willing to make small compromises for someone else and not being a selfish douchebag, rather put someone else's feelings first in your life, you can and will find love. And this movie, it takes the time to dissect and analyze what love between a man and a woman really is and how the two can relate to each other, even though we are two completely different beings entirely. And it puts forth the philosophy that romantic love starts with friendship and evolves to the point where they two can finally realize that they should be together and become more than friends. Both characters start out as newly independent youth who have their own worldviews and personalities, which tend to conflict with each other. But Harry is empathetic towards Sally's recent breakup, and the two commiserate over recent tragedies in their love lives and begin to share a bond. And over time, they begin to share more of themselves, and Harry even apologizes for their past interactions, showing that he is open to change and not stuck in his ways. But he begins to see Sally as a dear friend, not just another sex object, and they share a deep connection. They become very close friends and eventually become intimate. And Harry's whole worldview is blown to smithereens when he realizes that he truly feels something for Sally. Something more than just sex or friendship. But he realizes that he's in love with her. And the reason I love this movie and think it's one of the best films ever made is because... It's about allowing yourself to grow and what it means to allow yourself to fall head over heels, truly, madly, deeply in love with someone. You cannot come away from this film without feeling something, damn it. And the characters are so authentic, the writing's so good, the improv is perfect, and the message is timeless. The message being, when it's the right person, you just know. Romeo and Juliet, Paris and Helen of Troy, Cleopatra, Mark Anthony... Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier of Monaco, Harold and Maude, Casablanca, and all other tales of romance should kneel before the grandeur and spectacle that is when Harry met Sally. If aliens ever come down to Earth and ask me to define the human emotion of love for them, I'd give them this movie and tell them most of the answers they seek are in it. End 
rant. What do you do, 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 like do, do. Huh? You can boo. I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Most people boo. <laughs> but I mean, this movie, honestly, if I had to make a list of like top 100 films that of all time, this is very, very highly on that list. Yeah. It's my number one favorite movie for sure. Yeah. It's your babe. Yeah, I was yes. just thinking that we did babe, your favorite. Tonight, Kelly's favorite. Mm, we can do your Dude, favorite. Princess Bride next week. <laughs> Keep it going. I don't want to throw two Rob Reiner's back to back, but that's definitely on the list. Yeah. I'm going to have uh, the Ruby Brothers reenact it as I just go, <laughs> anybody want a peanut? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered that uh, the stuff Harry is saying at the end, like, is that something a woman or... I mean, not that you can speak for all of them, but <laughs> is, it, is it as effective as the movie kind of makes it out to be? You know, you mean, I mean you notice every little detail about me and say that you love it, even if it's a weird thing, like the crinkle between my nose when I look at you like you're nuts. Yes, yes, very effective. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, I mean, so what are your thoughts? I don't know. I think it was that. I don't know. It didn't seem like not to spoil the whole movie or whatever for people or be like one of those critics but like i don't know it didn't necessarily seem like it felt like just too big of a grand gesture that shouldn't have made up for him running out the door the morning after and then kind of yeah, being like think he, cold he, about the whole thing later and kind of like begging to get her back <laughs> i don't know yeah, i, think I just, it's just was always curious it's like i don't think it's poorly written but it's reminding her like here's how intimate we are like i know these all these things about you yeah. here's how close we really are yeah. and now he's finally saying and i love those things about you not just that i see it because we spend so much time together and we know each other so well but like sure. i know you so well and i love what i see like that yeah i guess yeah like, I are you still thought... talking about it <laughs> <laughs> well and i guess see, i thought there's... she makes such a big change so, like she goes from like never wanting to see him again to like kissing him and yeah, I mean, well, I know it's a movie. It was still it's put on, though. I mean, it was not. She was doing that whole like, no, I never want to see you again. Please chase after me, you know, kind of a. It was yeah. So that it might be a big change in terms I of the action. She was, of the I think she was heartbroken, and I think that he didn't really express why he was sorry. You know what I mean? Like he didn't get to the point of why he was why he wanted her back more. You know, like when he first shows up, she says, you know, you're you're lonely and it's New Year's. And he's like, no, that's not it. It's not just because it's New Year's and it's not because I'm lonely. It's because X, Y, Z. And she's like, now you get it. You know what I mean? Like they they had that that understanding right there. And he kind of is saying, look, I was an idiot. I was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. And I love everything about you. Please give me this grace to grow. And, you know, she accepts him and yada, yada, yada. I mean, I don't think it's that big of a change because she, like, yeah, I mean, I think she's angry and hurt. But really, the way she's acting is to force him into a position to have to fight for her. She's just saying, yeah, like, never looked at it. oh, my gosh, <laughs> you know, you're not inside the woman's psyche. <laughs> then we do that all you the freaking that. time. <laughs> Where it's like, you know, I'm no, hurt. I'm not sure that you really... Woman. That you really want to be with me or you really want to whatever you know and so even that scene where they're at lunch and she's like oh i just want to you know she's it, it, there is a little bit of inner monologue there i guess when they're preparing for their lunch together after they had sex oh yeah i and guess they're so. both like getting ready yeah, or whatever and she's like first. oh I yeah says first. He, she says i hope yeah. i can say first you know but really she's just trying to put up a wall to protect herself but she doesn't really want there to be a wall she wants there to be a wall so that he breaks through it and he's the hero and right. so kind of sets it up for them so i don't see it as like a big change it's like exactly what she wants to happen really yeah I, but i mean well, the first the, choice was in the same just, token though he is wrong she loves him what's that on the same token though he is wrong yeah he's wrong yeah like, i mean there was a reason she put up a wall yeah, like, because first choice is, oh, we have sex, you tell me right then, you love me, and we live happily ever after. That doesn't happen. Second choice is, I get mad at you, put up a wall, and you don't you don't let that stop you because you love me so much, you run through the streets of New York, and you come and tell me, and, you know, whether I'm hey, acting like a joke or not. I haven't yeah. forgiven Billy Crystal. I'm not <laughs> just saying I love you after it finally happened. I want Billy Crystal to run through the streets of New York for you. Yeah. Ashton. 
<laughs> Any final points you guys like to make? I mean, you talk about every single scene and why it's so funny and, and whatever. I always, the one I like is it's so subtle and I probably wouldn't even like give it a second thought, but Kelly and her sister always thought it was funny when Billy and his friend are speed walking. Speed walking. Oh, the power walking. Really goofy walk. Yeah. And Kelly starts laughing and I guess like her and Devin, her sister would do that all the time. So it's kind like of walking down funny. the street, we'd break out into it on yeah. the power walk. <laughs> There's yeah. so little funny things you can pick up. Like, or and, the, and there's the first time I ever had paprikash, and I didn't know that it was a real thing. <laughs> it's just a made-up word that Billy Crystal did. And that right there, can... there is too much pepper in, in my paprikash. You can't <laughs> Yeah, and it's a, a lot of as we were talking about these things. It's like you can't sell it that well on a podcast because there's so much physical comedy no. going on. Well, that's why uh, I hate doing comedies, is because it's like you know they're always better to hear the actual actors and comedians do it. You know, yeah. so right. But you know, hopefully, our reactions and enjoyment and laughter just talking yeah. about it credence to it at some point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Time for the plugs. Just a reminder, check us out on facebook.com slash nextlevelnerd for curated nerdy news, memes, and videos, and other fun content. And be sure to check out all of our podcasts with, uh, and share them with your friends and family, such as the Nerd Herds Gaming Podcast, Sugar Frosted Cereal, the TV podcast, which Kelly is uh, re- helping review Handmaid's Tale with Jess, my wife, and... Felicia, Joe's wife. So check that out. They're doing a great job. Uh, also check out Beyond the Multiverse, our comic book podcast, which I just recorded the Howard the Duck episode of, which should be dropping shortly. Um, and three, two, one, lay on the live action role play podcast, where you can hear Ashton and Evan talk about their love for all things LARP. Once again, we just want to remind you, check out LARPbox.com, home of the world's greatest subscription box for LARPers by LARPers, and to use the Next Level Nerd 10% discount code 321podcast at checkout. If you're enjoying the content we're producing for you on a weekly basis, we just want to let you know that you can go to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd and leave us a dollar or more. Patreon supporters at every level will receive access to bonus episodes, early releases of content, and our exclusive monthly show, Leveling Up, which is only for our Patreon supporters. And, um, yeah, we just recorded an episode of that the other night, and it was rough. Uh, Leveling Up, we are doing a uh, a D&D game, Dungeons & Dragons, and they're teaching me how to play uh, Joseph, Evan, Ashton, and Billy, and I am learning that if your character's a drunkard, you probably shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> That's closer to LARP. Yeah, I got uh, a little tipsy the other night. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great episode, I'm sure. Uh, the parts I can remember anyways. Also, uh, you'll help us reach our goal of creating more and better shows for you to enjoy if you hit that uh, Patreon donation. But if you can't support us with cash, support us with love by leaving us a review wherever you cast your pod on iTunes or Spotify. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you can catch our next show when Nico and I will be talking about Tropic Thunder. If you want to watch along, it's currently not streaming anywhere that I've seen, but it's available to rent or buy on most digital platforms. Until next time, spread the word. Spread the nerd. You know we Yeah, boy Back up off this shit Representing Cashmere 1-9 And we're clear oh, What the one with the fat boy tripping Remember that fat boy Slim song? Nope. Not at all <laughs> What we're doing with the fat boy tripping No? Nothing? Okay I feel like I just heard it It's settled. (laughs) Ha ha ha.